Good morning, Sussex County Bible Church. Can you hear me? Is this on? You can? Oh, good. I can't hear myself. Good morning, Sussex County Bible Church. As you can tell, things are a little bit different this morning, and that's because uh, it's, it's intentionally different. This morning, we're going to be talking about worship. So you're going to notice the guy that's speaking is going to be wearing a guitar the whole time. You're going to notice that there's going to be people coming up and down on stage singing songs during the sermon as opposed to having a normal order of service where we sing two songs, have scripture reading, another song, and then the message. Things are kind of turned upside down this morning, and that's intentional because I want us to focus all together on worship. So would you bow your heads and pray with me as we open our time? With the, with the message this morning, uh, asking for God's guidance and leadership. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for the opportunity you've given us this morning to be in your house. God, our schedule, our order of service is all goofy. It's mixed up. Things are looking different. Things are acting different. Things are sounding different. But God, it's not to distract from you, but quite the opposite, to draw us closer to you, to see things in songs maybe that we've not seen before, to hear a message from a psalm that, that would encourage and challenge and convict us. God, I pray that as your word goes forward this morning, that you would hide me behind the cross. I pray that everything that's said and done, done and sung from this stage this morning would be all of you. Help it to be all about you and not about us, none of us, God. Just hide us in the cleft of that rock, oh God, the rock of our salvation. We look forward to what you're going to do here in, in these moments together. Be lifted high, be honored, be glorified in Jesus' name, amen. We've been working through our, in, the, in our sermon series, a series called The Beautiful Church, so far in the past, we've talked about biblical authority, and we've talked about sound doctrine. And last week, we heard that loving the community and having strong families is incredibly important and are all characteristics of a vital, growing, beautiful church. Well, we have one more characteristic that we're going to look at this week and next week, and it's one of my favorite things to talk about. Just as a warning, if you know me, I talk fast. When I'm excited about something, I talk a little bit faster. So this is going to be a little bit faster than usual, so you really need to put your thinking caps on and really buckle in, because it's, it's going to be fast. This other characteristic of a beautiful church is worship. A beautiful church is a church that values worship. Psalm 95 to Psalm 100 is this beautiful section in the Psalms that focuses entirely on worship. We're going to look at our text this morning from just Psalm 95, the introductory psalm to that very series, the first one in the group. So if you have your Bibles with you, I'd invite you to turn with me to Psalm 95. We're going to read verses 1 through 11 of Psalm 95. And for those people that are coming in late, they're going to be so confused why the preaching is going on at 10 after 9. It'll be our little secret. Psalm 95, follow along with me as I read, beginning in verse 1. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are, also, are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God. We are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as at the day of Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For 40 years, I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their hearts and they have not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest." Worship is one of those overarching, mildly emotional, potentially conflict-ridden topics that is absolutely vital and central to our faith. To talk about worship can be difficult. Uh, different theories, different ideas of how we should worship, what we should sing, how we should pray, should we raise our hands. To talk about worship can be difficult. To not talk about it, though, is to ignore one of the most important and fundamental elements in the practicing of Christianity and something that we hold of dear value here at Sussex County Bible Church. When you hear worship, no doubt you automatically go mentally to the part of the service that is the music. However, music is only one aspect of our worship service. If we had worship folders, the bulletins, remember we used to have those, it would say on the top, worship service. That's not just referring to the singing or the playing part. That is referring to the entire service, from the prayers to the preaching to the music to the benediction to the reading of Scripture. Worship includes much more than just expressing emotion through singing, but that is a major, major part of it. If you've read the book of Psalms, you know that worship is centered around singing and praise. So what is worship? 
Well, the dictionary definition of worship is, well, this is a definition if I asked you, you would all know exactly what this definition is. I'm not going to break any new ground here. But the dictionary says the definition of worship is the feeling or expression of reverence and adoration for a deity. That's a given. Most of you would, would know that. Most of you live that. Recently, a pastor friend of mine that some of you know uh, recently preached on worship. And in preparation for my message on worship, I watched some of his message on worship to see what his thoughts and the directions he went. Different passage, different context, different church. But he gave a definition of worship that was much, much better than the feeling or expression of reverence and adoration for a deity. The definition he shared with his church really resonated to me. And he said this, worship is when you give your highest praise and deepest affections to something. Worship is when you give your highest praise and deepest affections to something. Let me ask you right from the outset. I know you're not prepared for these questions this early on in the worship service, but to what do you give your highest praise? To what do you give your deepest affections? To what or whom do you give your highest praise and deepest affections? Well, if we go back to the Old Testament, don't turn there. We're just going to reference them. But Deuteronomy 6 has some explanation of where our highest praise and deepest affections should be directed. Deuteronomy 6, 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This is calling Israel to listen to what they're about to say about God. The God. The God above gods. The God over all gods. This God. Verse 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. This verse is not in a traditional passage about worship, but this one verse tucked in here in Deuteronomy shows us the essence of true worship. Our highest praise and deepest affection is loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our might. I like to think of us as a group of worshipers. When you got out of your car this morning, did anyone else slide in the parking lot? I turned this morning and I was like, oh man, don't cancel church, I'm preaching this morning. Um, when we walk in out of our cars, across the parking lot, into the building, you enter into this room a worshiper. Whether you want to or not, you are entering into certain things that are going to happen here that are a form of worship. If you walk into an airport, you know exactly what's going to happen. You walk past the gate, or you walk past the opening doors, you go to the ticket counter. You get your ticket, you show them your passport, do all that kind of things, you go through security. Then you go through running your bags through everything. There's all these steps that you go to. You are a traveler at that point. Similarly, when you come to church, you're a worshiper. There are things that are expected of you that, that you should be doing. You should be prepared when you come in here. Your heart should be ready to sing. Your heart should be ready to accept preaching and to hear the preaching of the word. Your heart should be ready to accept and be part of the corporate prayers that we, that we do as a group. We're a group of worshipers, and I kind of like to give us a cool name. I'd like to think that we're the SCBC Worship Collective. That's what we do. We come here, and our hearts are ready for worship. Every week, we gather together to sing, to pray together, to hear scripture read, to see one another, to have a relationship with one another, to share stories about maybe the highs and lows of this week or last week, maybe to make plans for getting together for coffee or dinner sometime this week, or maybe figuring out what we're going to do for lunch together uh, on, on the Lord's Day. But as a worship collective, as our SCBC worship collective, we need to identify that when we come together, we are gathering here for praise. We are gathering here for worship. The priority is not to, to see one another and talk to one another. The horizontal aspect is good, but that's not the reason why we come to church on Sunday. We come to church for the vertical aspect, worshiping God with our highest praise and our deepest affections. In the passage before us in Psalm 95, we're going to see two parts to the psalm. There's an invitation, and then there's a warning about worship. So put your nose back in Psalm 95 and follow along. We're going to read Psalm 95, 1 through 7a again, and you'll see why it's 7a. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Notice the excitement in verses one and two. I hope I represented that for you well enough. Oh, come, come on, let's sing to the Lord. Something is gonna happen when we sing to the Lord. When we worship God, something's great gonna great's gonna happen. So come on, let's go. Let's sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let's make a joyful noise. Come to his presence with thanksgiving. Let's make a joyful noise to him. 
Let's do all of these things together. Let's get excited. If you've ever seen the Net Bible, New English Translation Bible, translates the verse this way. I love this. Come, exclamation point. Let's sing for joy to the Lord, exclamation point. Let's shout out praises to our protector who delivers us, exclamation point. Three phrases, one verse, three exclamation points. There is some excitement that is to be, that is to be put into this text. Up until last week, you might remember if you, if you live on, in Delaware, in Sussex County, that Delaware doesn't get snow very often. Snow in Delaware is a pretty rare thing. And for somebody who comes from Vermont, it's a little bit sad that we don't ever get any measurable snow here. We may get flurries here and there. We may get a little bit just to tease us, but never any snow that lasts any time at all. I would venture to guess that last week during the snow, some of you or even some of your children went outside to go play in the snow. That's what we do. I include me in that. That's what we do. We go play in the snow because snow is the best. Inevitably, your kids would get get excited and start to try and make a snowman and they would they would make that first part of the snowman and make the second part third part and they'd decorate it and put the stones in there for buttons maybe coals and maybe a pipe if you're like the song or some put some mittens on there put some hats on there, and you'd, they'd decorate this unbelievable snowman and then they would stand back and marvel it and go in the house and have some hot cocoa right that's just what kids do well there's one part of there that I left out what part did I leave out parents can you think of this these kids have been outside all morning building this wonderful snowman then they throw the door open and they do what? Mom, you gotta come see this snowman. It's the best snowman I've ever built. Come, everybody in the tri-state area knows that you have built, this child has built a snowman because everybody in the world is invited to come see what they've done. A, because there's not a lot of snow and a lot of opportunities for snowmen. So when you get to build a snowman, it's rare, but they want to show off what they have done. They are calling out for you and for everyone else to, to come to come and see. The excitement that they carry with them into that house to call you, mom and dad, to come check out what they've done is the same kind of excitement that this psalm is illustrating. It's trying to generate that kind of excitement. Come on and see. Something awesome is here. This is amazing. This is worship. Come, let's sing to the Lord. History attributes David as the author of this psalm. There's some discussion whether it is or not, but for our arguments, let's let's say it's David. Can you kind of hear David? I've never heard his voice, but I can kind of hear his voice in my head saying, come check this out. Chris, come check this out. Let's sing to the Lord. Let's make a joyful noise. I I don't even know if I can sing, but if I can't sing right now, I'm going to make noise for Jesus because I'm just going to do something. This is going to be great. If you're too excited to sing, just grunt. Make a joyful noise. Let's do something and worship God. Does that kind of excitement describe your heart as you were walking in from the muddy parking lot this morning? Are you excited for what's to come? Are you begrudgingly here because, oh, it's Sunday and that's what we do. Church is early, thankfully, so I have rest of the day. Is that kind of where you are, or are you excited to come, to come and be a part of something, to come as our SCBC worship collective and be a part of a group who sings praises to God, who prays as a, a 200 people in here all praying together at the same time, the same message that is being prayed. Are you here in a, in a sense of worship, ready to hear from God through the sermon to be encouraged? I hope you're excited when you come to gather with the saints on the Lord's day. In Hebrew, that call to come is a command. Last week, remember, Pastor Dwayne was talking about imperatives and indicatives. Indicatives are those really vanilla, kind of boring parts of, of, of the day. I went to work this morning. That's indicative. I preached this morning. That's indicative. You go to bed, brush your teeth, and don't let me hear another word out of you is an imperative. It's a command. It's something that you are to do. It's a command. And when you're in homiletics class, when you're in preaching, That's one of the things that you look for in a text is an imperative because it's a command from God to us. In this entire 11 verses of Proverbs 95, we have two imperatives. The imperative in the text. There's no, if you can come, I would expect you to be here. Nope. There's no, hey, would you come with me to worship? Nope. That's not how it works. It's an imperative. It doesn't leave a lot of room for excuse. The original audience would have recognized the significance of there only being two imperatives in this text as well, and so it's important that we do too. As we move a little bit further into verse 1 past the imperative, we are introduced to a theme of redemption, and it says, let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. I mentioned that this was a redemptive, uh, a theme of redemption. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. It might cause us to think a little bit, but this theme of redemption reflects all the way back on Deuteronomy 32. In Deuteronomy 32, Moses reminds Israel that throughout their history, Jehovah himself, Yahweh, is your rock. 
right from the beginning. Exodus 32, Moses is telling everyone, Jehovah is the rock. Verses 3 and 4 of, De of Deuteronomy 32 says, For I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Let's ascribe greatness to our God. He is the rock. His works are perfect, and all his ways are just. Fast forward a little bit to uh, further in, that, in uh, Exodus. Exodus 17 talks about the rock that Moses struck, which flowed with water. In essence, saving Israel from certain death by providing water for them. Now fast forward all the way to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and we read that Paul himself talks about all of these passages, the one in Exodus, the one in Numbers, the one in Deuteronomy. Paul refers in 1 Corinthians 10, he says about this very event in Israel's history, that rock is Christ. This is not just a rock that is struck for water. This is not just a rock that Jehovah acts as to you. He is the rock. That rock is Christ. In Christ alone, we find peace and strength and security. Amid all the changes and frustrations and what we would refer to as shifting sand and, last, and, and lack of rock, the rock of our salvation stands firm. In 1 Samuel 22, we read, the Lord lives and blessed be my rock and exalted be my God, the rock of my salvation. Psalm 62 says, he alone is my rock and my salvation. And it adds, he is my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. This week, as I was working, I was kind of just spending some time thinking about this title, the rock of my salvation, the rock of our salvation. And the more I considered it, the better it got, the cooler it got. This is such a rich, rich metaphor. Think of big rocks, not like rocks like that you would throw at each other or play dodge rock with down a hill or something like that. These are boulders. These are massive, massive rocks. Big rocks are heavy. Big rocks are sturdy. Big rocks are immovable. Have you ever tried to move a boulder? Ever stood on the backside of a mountain and really gave it your all to try and move that thing? It's not going anywhere. And that's God. That's God for you. Guys, God is not going anywhere. His promises are everlasting. His presence is eternal. God is immovable. He is not going anywhere. The rock of our salvation. Rocks are long-lasting. They provide a good picture of God's attribute of immutability, a fancy way of saying unchangeability, his changelessness. He won't change. When I go back to Vermont, the same mountains that I hiked on when I was 5 and 10 and 25 are the same mountains that now when I'm 43, I can still walk on. Those rocks haven't gone anywhere. Those boulders haven't moved. There is no, no, no promise that's going to change. There is no, no um, fact that God is going to be moved. God is going to be swayed to do something that it would be bad for us. The rock of my salvation. It's a beautiful metaphor. It's an awesome metaphor. But it also carries a sense of familiarity in the minds of the original audience. To the original audience, what this was written, it's in Israel. If you've been to Israel, if you've seen pictures of Israel, you know that rocky cliffs and crag, mountain crags are everywhere in Israel. And the Israelites often found themselves hiding in these caves for protection, for, for uh, hiding. These mountain crevices, they would hide from the enemy. And considering the many battles that were fought in Israel, many, many battles fought in Israel, these rocky areas were also ideal locations for strong, protective fortresses hid in the cleft of the rock. Therefore, the phrase, the rock of my salvation, undoubtedly resonated with them on an even deeper level than it would for us. They can see those rocks and know that we hid in there. God protected us in that cave from the enemy. God protected us in this mountain fortress from the enemy. Now, because music makes it possible to address attributes of God in a group and allows us to all sing together the same words of worship to our God, let's start our singing worship part of the sermon of the worship service as we sing together to the rock of our salvation. Would you stand as we sing Cornerstone this morning? Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. We put into practice this morning already what we learned, sing to the rock of our salvation. Every week, including this week, you heard Jonathan deliver the call to worship. The worship leader will bring the call to worship to open the service, and then we sing. Now, when we deliver a call to worship in our services, we are simply reminding people of who God is and helping them to see Jesus as the only one here who is worthy of all, all praise and all of our affection. We put the value we hold on Jesus on display as we intentionally move our focus away from the weak. We, we leave all of our troubles at the door. We leave all of our burdens in the back, and we come in here collective to sing and to worship God. This is the significance of a call to worship. The call to worship is not just something that we add. It's not just something that we do as a time filler or something to add a little bit time to make the service a certain length. 
This is the significance of the call of worship, to hold Jesus on display, to intentionally move from the weak into this time of focus and worship. And in this psalm, Psalm 95, we have two calls to worship. The first call is in, in, the first call to worship, the first call to praise is in verses 1 and 2, followed by the reasons for the praise. The second call to worship is in verse 6, and it narrows down the focus beautifully to a call for God's covenant people. Psalm 95 commands us to come and worship twice and reminds us who God is just once. Psalm 95 begins with an invitation to come and to sing to the Lord and to make a joyful noise. The word in Hebrew for make a joyful noise literally just means to shout or to make a loud noise with your mouth. We are invited to enter God's presence and shout with loud and exuberant shouts of praise. We are invited to praise God because he is our Savior. The verses that follow list all these reasons for praising God. The Lord is a great God. The, the Lord is a king above all gods. Our God made the depths of the earth and the highest mountains, the seas as well as the dry land. And then just in case we miss that first call to worship, come, let us worship, come on. He hits us again with another call in verse 6, a second time. They're both different invitations, though, if you look closely. The first invitation is to come worship. One of the two imperatives in this text is in verse 1. The other imperative is in verse 6, and both are requiring us to come. A joyful noise is not merely a noise for its own sake. Our world is filled with a lot of noise. Our world is filled with a lot of harmful, damaging, distracting noise. A joyful noise, on the other hand, is a bold declaration of God's glorious name and nature with shouts, with clapping, with other outward expressions of praise. A joyful noise often includes music, such as singing, such as playing instruments, and dancing before the Lord. While there is time for quiet reverence in the presence of the Lord, which we'll look at in a moment, God also delights in our outward displays of joyful, reckless abandon as we worship him with all that we have. Scripture is filled with examples of this. You think of David dancing. He danced. He was noisy and active. Miriam played the tambor tambourine while singing and dancing. The children of Israel shouted and sang praises to God. They went back and forth and praised across the mountains. Solomon lifted hands before all the people. Paul and Silas sang loudly in jail before the earthquake came and, and broke all of their bonds. And Jesus himself was, rest, was welcomed into Jerusalem with loud shouts of joy and loud shouts of praise. The people of God are people who are filled with joy. Let me say it this way. The people of God are people who are supposed to be filled with joy. And on occasion, it's required of us to celebrate God with joyful noise, or more accurately, joy-filled noise. Make that noise filled with joy. So let's move on to the next command then. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. The verb translates worship means literally to prostrate yourself to the point of flatness, to prostrate yourself before someone. Worship means to get before someone and not even be able to look at them because you just want to give them the, the, the honor that they're due. Humility, meaning prostrating yourself. Derek Kidner in his commentary on Psalms notes that all three verbs in verse 6 are, quote, concerned with getting low before God. So while our worship should be exuberant and joyful, it must also be reverent. We are worshiping our maker. We are truly doing Deuteronomy 6, loving the Lord our God with all of our hearts and with all of our souls and with all of our, all of our might. We can worship God through loud shouts of praise, but we can also worship God through kneeling and bowing and worshiping before our king, our Lord, our maker. Do you see the difference? One is the kid kicking down the door celebrating the, the awesomeness of his snowman. And the other one is going out to the snowman and being thrilled with what he has done. On a much bigger level, we burst into church excited about what God's going to do here, and then we bow down and kneel and worship before God, our creator, uh, our maker. As Christians, we are to be simultaneously filled with joy to shout our praise in response to the first call to worship, while being fully aware of what God has done for us in the second call to worship, as we kneel with submissive hearts before him during our worship service. Notice the language of that second call. Let us worship. Let us bow down and kneel. It's the language of humble adoration. Do you remember the phrase of the hymn, and I shall bow in humble adoration? Well, that's what this is getting at. Let's sing that hymn together, How Great Thou Art. And as we sing that phrase, as, and when I bow in humble adoration, stand, worship, 
how great thou art. Let's sing that song together, how great thou art. Would you stand? So in our text, we have two commands to come sing and worship our great God. We have two commands to come sing and say, how great thou art, how great is our God. And right in the middle, verse 3 begins an explanation of why should we worship God. The answer is given because the Lord is a great God, or for the Lord is a great God. 95, uh, Psalm 95 verse 3 says, For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Now the Hebrew word great in Psalm 95 carries the meaning that God is one, but God is better than all the others. He is one above all in importance. The only one among others that matters. It's such a cool word. So verse 3 then would say that among all of the gods, all those local pagan gods, all the idols, all the individual house gods, among all those gods that are existent on the planet around the world, God stands above them all. And then he goes even further and says, of all the kings, of all the men who have set themselves up as kings, the dozens of kings, the hundreds of kings, the men who think they're the king of their own house, God is exalted above all of those kings as well. He is great above all. Verses 3 through 5 continue to show the responsibility we have for worship by showing extremes. This is a, a, a part of speech, which is kind of cool. We see that we, we know that from the text, <coughs> we know that God knows what's going on in the depths of the earth. And the lowest part that you can think of in the depths of the earth, God knows what's going on there. But then the next phrase said, God knows exactly what's going on in the highest top of any, the highest mountain that you can think of. So the highest of highs and the lowest of lows, God knows what's going on in both places. God also knows what's going on in the sea. And God also knows what's going on on the not sea, on the land. So when he sees this, when we see the low to the high, we know that God is not just the God of the mountain and God is just the, mount, the God of the valleys. He's what? The God of everything in between. So anywhere that is higher than the lowest part or lower than the highest part and anything that's not sea or land is a place that God doesn't know about. So therefore we know that God knows about what? Everything. He's everywhere. This is a testament to his presence, his omnipresence, his omniscience, his omnipotence. This is a Psalm 139 just shot in the arm. God knows from our uprisings, your sittings. God knows everything that's going on in all of these places. He, he continues to show he knows what's happening on there. We can't think of a place that is, not exclude, that is not included in these extremes. High up in the mountain, deep in the earth, in the ocean, on the land. If God knows everything that's happening in these locations, then he obviously knows what's happening on in between. And guess what? We are part of that in between. He isn't just the God of the mountains or the valleys. He's the God of the in between as well. The difference for Israel, that unlike the idols of the pagans, these localized gods we were talking about, they have a God of the atmosphere. They have a God of the valleys. They have a God of the mountains. They have a God of the cities. There's a little idol you can put in your home that's a God of your home. You have all of these different competing gods. God made all of those God, made, God owns it all, and even more, he made us. We see in verse, uh, verse 6 that he is our maker. Therefore, we should worship God in the reality of his presence and his person. There's a beautiful contrast in these calls to worship. First, make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise on one side, and then let us worship. Let's bow down and kneel before the Lord, our maker, on the other side. Both are presented in Psalm 95 as calls to worship, and both are our responsibility now, just as they were to the original audience. Psalm 95, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Come, let us go into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout with songs of praise. Now, right on the heels of these two calls to worship, we see something that's rather unexpected. We see something that's very strange. Read with me Psalm 95, verses 7b to 11. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For 40 years, I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Probably the last thing you saw coming in this passage was a warning, was an ultimatum, a threat even. We are warned against closing our hearts to God's voice. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. What a strange way to end the psalm, right? 
I feel like this psalm could have ended in verse 7, and we would have walked away encouraged, excited to sing to the Lord and worship and bow down before him. If it would have ended at the uh, middle of verse 7, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Smiles all around. This is great. This is a wonderful section of text. But no, Psalm 95 continues on with this warning. We had two calls to worship, an invitation at the beginning, and then now at the end of the psalm, we have a warning. Have you ever had an experience at the very name of a location that you were that eventually becomes, the, becomes synonymous with something negative? About 15 years ago, our little family of three, at that point it was just me and Julie and Alex, we went to Williamsburg on vacation. And one evening we decided to take our little Alex and, and the two of us to go to this, this really nice restaurant. We wanted to go to this famous seafood buffet in Williamsburg called Captain George's. Maybe some of you have been there. Maybe some of you have eaten there. The food is wonderful. Well, Julie and I walked in there with a one or two-ish year old Alex. And little did we know we were about to have an incredibly memorable experience. But not a good memorable experience. To this day... We have no earthly idea why Alex was so bad. He was awful. Like, not like, oh, oh, I understand. No, 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 no. This is epic awful. We don't know what the problem was. He was crying, and he was fussing, and he was just completely miserable, wholly inconsolable to his mom and dad. He wasn't tired. He wasn't sick. He was just plain bad. That little pagan that we brought into that restaurant, like, turned the world upside down, not in a good way. The whole time we were there, nobody at our table was happy. And nobody at any other table in the place was happy either. We had that loud kid at a nice restaurant, and it was a miserable but memorable experience for us, as well as everyone else in, in the restaurant. Years later, we still talk about that day, and we knew that at future restaurants, we would never have a Captain George experience, Alex. Misery had become synonymous with Captain George's. For Israel... Meribah and Massa had become synonymous with disobedience, with stubbornness, with grumbling, all enemies of worship. Let's just park here for one second. If you come rolling into church, into the parking lot, and you are bringing in your stubbornness, I'm not going to sing. I hate singing singings for girls, men. Um, I hear that sometimes. Um, if you're coming in here grumbling about the traffic and the parking lot, and that guy didn't give you a a good look this morning, or that guy that you live with is a horrible person, or that woman that you live with is a horrible person, husbands, wives, you know what I'm talking at. If you're coming in stubborn and grumbling and in a general state of disobedience, you are bringing enemies to worship. These are not to be part of our worship. And we see that in Psalm 95. Let's take a walk back in Old Testament, Old Testament history for just a moment. Israel has been taken captive in Egypt and has been forced into slavery. We see that in Exodus. Eventually, the Lord would deliver his people from Egyptian bondage. Remember the plagues, the let my people go, and plague after plague after plague times 10, let my people go. They were given instructions about taking possession of the land that God had promised to their forefathers. This land was an unbelievable land that flowed allegedly with milk and honey. Prior to entry, however, they scouted out the land, and they came back and they became convinced among themselves that they could not defeat the current inhabitants of the land. Even though God said, this land is yours, you will defeat them. They forgot that promise and decided to just go it on their own. Their lack of faith in God's word and promise brought, the, brought forth the wrath of God. You'll remember that God didn't take this very lightly. They were cursed to walk around the wilderness, to wander around the wilderness, the desert area, for 40 years until that unbelieving generation died off having never stepped foot in the promised land. That's a big deal. After one full year of wandering the wilderness, after their release from Egypt, the Israelites were faced with a major problem in the middle of the desert to which they responded very, very poorly. They had no water. So it's estimated, I did some research this week, it's estimated that the water requirements for one of the Israelites, just one Israelite wandering in the desert, would have been approximately 20 quarts per day in the heat that they would have. This would include some washing occasionally, some maybe brushing teeth, some pouring water just to be cool, and mostly water just to drink. About 20 quarts per day in the heat that they were in. The heat was somewhere between 95 to 108 degrees Fahrenheit. Therefore, it's thought the Israelites would have needed, with a group their size, 11 million gallons of water each day to drink, to wash themselves and to clean dishes, etc. This would be the equivalent of a freight train of tank cars 1,800 miles long to bring them water for one day. There's 
over between three and four million people on here, 20 quarts per person. That is a lot of water. They had no lakes in the middle of the desert. They found a few wells in the middle of the desert. So how do they get that much water in a land where water is scarce? There's only one answer. God provided that. So now when we don't have water, what do we do? We raise up arms to kill Moses because he brought us out here to die. Come on, Israel. Remember what God is doing to you. When their water supply ran low at Massa, the people who had seen miracle after miracle with their own eyes began questioning the very faithfulness of God himself. Therefore, they complained and they struggled with Moses until God gave them water. That's the reason they named this place Massa and Meribah. Massa means proving. Remember, um, for 40 years I loathed that generation. They put me to the proof. Although they had seen my work, they named it proving. And Meribah means strife. Then eventually, later on, near the end of their wandering in the deserts, they again came to a place with no water. Desperate again for water, they complained and grumbled and did not believe God would provide water as he did years earlier. Despite years and years of amazing miracles in the desert, seeing God provide them with shade, with heat, with light, with comfort, with food, with meat, with bread, with all of these great things. Despite these years of amazing miracles in the desert, the people still had not learned to trust God's provision because their hearts were hardened. Don't you dare bring a hard heart into this room, worship collective, as we try to worship. Hardened hearts are the enemy of worship as well. Masa and Meribah represent grumbling, complaining, dissatisfaction, and faithlessness. And after the second time struggling with water, it represented an, inabil an inability for them to learn from the past. The entire second half of the psalm is talking about wilderness wandering. From Masa to Meribah to the 40 years they went away from him and refused to learn the lessons to the oath that God made, the promise that, the immovable promise that God made that they will never enter into his rest, the promised land. Now, as we tie everything together, it's important to identify that as we are called to worship, we are called and admonished to beware, to not harden our hearts just like the Israelites did in the desert. So how do we harden our hearts then for worship? Well, I'm glad you ask. I think, I think it occurs when our entire focus is on asking and receiving gifts from God without acknowledging that what God is doing in our lives. Worship offers us an intimate opportunity for us to open our hearts to God alone, to open up our hearts before the Lord. And if our worship is all about ourselves and pleasing ourselves and getting what we want out of it, we fall into the same trap of the Israelites who received a lot but thanked God very little because of their lack of faith. This morning we saw these two commands, two calls to worship. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let's make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let's get excited. Let's get exuberant. Let's make some noise as we worship. And then we saw, come, let us worship and bow down. Both of these give us opportunities to behold God. Both of these give us opportunities to behold our God. So would you stand as we sing together in, in a loud voice of worship. Let's sing for that first call to worship. Behold our God and really lift our voices together in praise. Behold our God. Would you stand? I want you to notice one thing about God's call. God's call doesn't begin with a list of do's and don'ts. It doesn't start with a list, a lengthy list of requirements or things we have to do in order to get in or to make the cut to get in. There isn't a ranking system from the get-go where we have a, a scale by which to measure ourselves against the faithfulness or the faithlessness of our neighbors. It all, it all starts with God's call to us at the beginning, a call into worship, a call into community, a call into life where we are ever becoming more and more like the king that we serve, the king who is our maker. God invites us two times so we won't miss it. We are called to worship and we are called to humility. And we are called to participate in representing God's reign to the world. As we bring this ancient text, Psalm 95, all the way up to 2024, we have to close with a realization. Psalm 95 ends with some language that would indicate very clearly and unmistakably that God is not very happy with us. God says he loathed that generation. That generation are a people who go astray. And that generation is people who do not know his ways. And because of that, he has promised that they will never enter into his rest. In Romans 5, the Apostle Paul has a word for those who were or are the enemies of God. You'll remember that in time past, we were the enemies of God. We were the generation that went astray in our hearts. We were the generation that refuses to learn. We are the ones who regularly put God to the test. And because of that, we are not welcome into the eternal rest of heaven. But Paul writes, you see, at just the right time, while we were powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. 
Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, like verse 10 says, enemies, Christ died for us. So let us encourage each other not to harden our hearts against God's voice. Let's encourage ourselves to trust that the God whose grace pierced Paul's heart while he was still killing Christians as Saul can still rescue the most hardened sinners and bring them into the eternal rest promised to all of God's children. We have only two options when it comes to worship. We've been called and commanded to sing for joy to the rock of our salvation or grumble about our trials with an evil, unbelieving heart, bring enemies of worship into God's house and incur God's wrath. If you go with the first option, you will enjoy God's rest both now and for eternity. If you harden your heart, God swears in his anger, you shall not enter into my rest. We read another place in scripture, today is the day of salvation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today with our hearts filled with gratitude and praise. God, we lift our voices in joy, acknowledging your sovereignty over the heavens and the earth. You are the great shepherd, and we are your sheep. We are your flock. You are the rock of our salvation. Lord, today we choose to hear your voice and to not harden our hearts as Israel did at Massa and Meribah. In the busyness of life, amidst the challenges that we face, help us to always recognize the melodies of your grace and your mercy. May we not be swayed by doubt or led astray by the noise of this world. Help us to give you our highest praise and deepest affections because you're worthy of it. Help us to love you, O Lord, our God, with all of our hearts, all of our souls, and all of our might. May our lives be a testimony to your goodness and faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand as we sing our final song of worship, Only a Holy God. 